So we just worked out for an elastic collision with two different masses approaching each other at different velocities. And we have an elastic collision where we conserve energy. We came up with these two equations. This is just conservation of momentum, where here's your unknowns, V1 final, V2 final. And then this is really an, uh, sort of an algebraically altered version of con conservation of energy. Or again, V1 final, V2 final. So if you were to be given a problem about an elastic collision where you gave some initial conditions and you just had to solve for some final velocity, you could probably just use these. You could start plugging in your numbers and just solve for V1F or V2F. But we actually do like to go through and give sort of a general symbolic answer. We like to solve these for V1F because the solution gives you a little bit of intuition for what's going to happen. Rather than just solving a specific problem, you can maybe learn things about how systems will behave. So all you got to do is be able to solve two equations, two unknowns, solve this for V1F, solve this for V2F. If you do, you might end up in a little bit of an algebraic nightmare going through loops and pages and pages of algebra. So I'm going to show you uh, the right way to get there. And also because I had the world's greatest algebra teacher, Mr. Owie. Yes, there you see Mr. Owie. Yes, he hated consonants. So anyway, what? Oh, come on. Get that out of there. Come on. Uh. OK, do we have a time for like a therapy break? OK, no, let's just keep going. Let's just pretend we didn't see that. OK, so what we're going to do is figure out the smart way to do this. The smart way is we want to solve for V1F is to get this by itself, but don't divide through by the M1. Let's keep the M1 here. M1 V1F equals, and then we'll say, oh, it equals M1 V1I, the initial velocity, plus M2 V2I, the other mass's initial velocity, uh, minus M2. And now we've got V2F which is an unknown we don't want. So then we'll solve this one and stick this V2F in there. This is the quickest way to get there. So this is equal to V1I, that's an initial known, plus V1F, that's the one we're looking for, that's good. Um, and then minus V2I, another initial one that we know. So there's our unknown, and there's our unknown right there. Not if, there we go, one F. All right, and then what you want to do is we're solving for V1F, so you get them all on one side, all right? So we have minus M2 V1F. Hmm, so we bring that over here. That'll become plus M2 V1F. So we have M1 V1F plus M2 V1F. We can go ahead and pull out the M1 plus M2 V1F. All right, and let's just see what we have left over. Uh, we have, um, what do we want to do with what's left over? Let's go ahead and start separating things. We have M1 V1I and we have uh, minus M2 V1I. So let's go ahead and pull our um, M1 minus M2 out of that. M1 minus M2 V1I. Okay, and then what else do we have? We have the uh, V2Is here. So we have M2 V2I minus M2 minus V2I. So those two minuses become a plus, and you get a two, interesting, plus 2M2V2I. All right, so now we're going to solve for the thing we're looking for, V1F. We're just going to bring the M1 plus M2 under the bottom. All right, so we get V1F. This is the real deal. Mass 1's final velocity in this case is M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2, and all that times V1 initial plus, so it's got two big terms, plus, and then we've got 2M2 over, again, the sum, M1 plus M2, and all that times V2 initial speed. And this is sort of the general solution for how fast mass 1 will go in this collision, no matter what the values of V1 and V2I and V2I are, or how fast they're initially going. They have to be going in a way where they will actually collide. Right? They have to actually be heading towards each other. But that's how you get it. We could do the exact same algebra to get V2F. Almost identical steps. And we would find we get an almost identical solution. We would get the 2MI, or I'm sorry, uh, 2M1 
over m1 plus m2 on this side, and that would be times v1i. Ugh. V1i plus, and then we would get the, the difference over the sum, m2 uh, minus 1 minus m1 over m1 plus m2, and this would be the v2i part, v2 initial. That's the other one we could get with essentially the same algebra. So we were able to do that in just a few steps because I knew the answer, right? I was cheating, right? So I know that this is the answer. I know you're going to have an m1 plus m2 in the bottom. So that's how I knew we're trying to work an m1 plus m2 over here. Right? So there's tricks to uh, making things work out on the board. Let's see. So this is the general solution, and I told you that you can get some insight from this general solution. And you're looking at it thinking, you can? Uh, but you can in special cases. All right, so let's think about... Uh, a couple of special cases. One is, what if the masses are equal? So let's over here look at equal masses. M1 equals M2, right? If M1 equals M2, let's look at this whole big mess. If M1 equals M2, this term is zero, right? M minus M is zero. So V1 final doesn't even depend on V1 initial. Weird. What if m1 equals m2 here? This is 2m, and this is 2m, and it cancels, and it's 1. So what you get is that uh, v1 final, how fast this one is going in the end, is the same as v2 initial. That's weird. All this complicated formula reduces just to that. However fast this one uh, is going, was going at the beginning is how fast this one goes at the end. Let's look at this one. Uh, same thing's going to happen. If m1 equals m2, then this becomes 1. So you get v2f equals v1i plus, and what does this make? 0 plus nothing. So what this tells us is if the masses are equal, the, um, the, uh, they exchange velocities. is all that happens. And you can imagine this would do a good job of conserving momentum. Right? It's two masses, the same mass, they have one set of velocities and they just switch. And then they change the velocities, therefore the momentum would be conserved. Uh, we can look at a couple of cases of this. Uh, here are a couple of these carts. One has a spring-loaded end on it, so it can have kind of an elastic collision. And I've added a weight to this one to make up for the extra mechanics in this one. Right? So the weights, the masses are pretty much the same. So if I leave this one here not moving and say this one we're going to give some velocity, they're going to crash into each other, and they should just exchange uh, their velocities. So let's see. And they did. You saw this one got the velocity. That one had it stopped. This one took off at about the same speed uh, or velocity. You can kind of see it with them moving as well. I'm going to move this one kind of slow, and I'm going to move this one at it kind of fast. And you can probably kind of tell that obviously this one goes fast and this one goes slow but pretty much at the same rates that they were. So again, two objects of the same mass in an elastic collision will simply exchange velocities in this 1D world we're living in right now. Let's look at another insight that we get from these equations. Uh, what if uh, M2 is stationary? It is not moving. We did sort of one case of that here. But let's look at it more carefully. Now the masses are not necessarily equal, but m2 is not moving. That means v2i is 0. So that's just going to simplify these. It's going to take away this term. All right, so then you're going to say velocity 1f is uh, the difference equals uh, m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 right, times v1i, or v uh, yeah, v1i. Right. So what this tells you is um, if m1, if m1 is less than m2, m1 bounces back. It'll bounce off of something if it hits something bigger than it is. Right. So we can show you that. We can take m1, m2. Here they're the same mass. Right. So that would be a case where it would not move at all, v1 final would be 0. We did that over there. But now, let's make uh, m2 heavier than m1. 
Okay. So now it's got a lot of extra weight on it. Now if I send in mass 1, uh, that should be a negative number. Right? V1F is going to be negative. It should bounce backwards. And there it goes. Bounces backwards. This one goes forward. If we look at the case where, uh, let's see, if M1 is greater than M2, then it's going to barrel through is the phrase I'll use. So we can show you that as well. We can put the larger mass on M1. In this case, M1 should push M2 along and just keep on going. Let's see. Yep, there you go. Kept going. And then I guess the final insight we can get from this is to say V2F is uh, the 2M1 over M1 plus M2. and uh, V1i. Right? And all you get from this is no matter what the case of one greater than the other, this is always positive. M2 will always go forward. Right? You can't really imagine. The only way it could go backwards is if this one also went backwards, and then that would clearly not conserve momentum if everything started moving that way. So we know that all these equations uh, make sense in these limiting cases. And that's what the general solution is good for, to learn some sort of intuition for how things interact.